All right. Well, uh, once again, we are here with our um, uh, Toro University Diversity Now series. Uh, super excited about today's topic. Uh, we're talking about accessibility for all K through 12 students in remote learning. And I will just say I'm particularly interested in this conversation because uh, in the past week, I've had about three or four parents um, with students with IEPs who are very concerned about the education their children are gonna be receiving this fall, especially considering what they experienced in the spring. And so I'm hoping I can get some tools out of this conversation so that I can be more equipped uh, to help these families. But I think we're all really kind of looking forward uh, to what our, our panelists have to say. And so I'm going to turn it over to Linda Haynes and uh, let her take the floor. She's going to be driving the bus today. I'm going I'm to take a back seat in the back and, and really just uh, listen to what's going on and, and, and enjoy the ride. So Linda. Hi everyone. So I'm um, Linda Haynes uh, and I am the chair of special ed here at Toro. And um, I am going to be introducing uh, the panelists Mary Frances Rice is an assistant professor of literacy at University of New Mexico. She teaches writing pedagogy and digital composition. Her scholarship uses interdisciplinary approaches to study the literacies and identities of online teachers and learners. Mary was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Kansas Center on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities. She is also an online learning consortium emerging scholar, a Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute fellow, and a consultant for the Inclusive Digital Era Collaborative. Mary taught junior high English language arts, ESL, and reading support classes for 10 years prior to becoming a professor. Our other panelist, uh, Ray Rose, has been actively involved in innovation and education in a variety of roles and responsibilities his entire career. His career began as a junior high science teacher, then progressed through the roles as a curriculum coordinator, guidance counselor, and school administrator. Ray developed an understanding of policy, monitoring and compliance in Massachusetts Department of Education before moving to the world of nonprofit educational research and development. Ray helped create the nation's first virtual high school over two decades ago, developed the model for effective online pedagogy and online course facilitation and helped establish the first standards for online course design and delivery. He currently spends his time consulting with the Inclusive Digital Era Collaborative at the University of Kansas focusing on students with disabilities. And um, her, uh, Mary, before yeah, you joined us, we were saying, I actually went to University of Kansas as well, and did my master's there in, in Kansas in the Applied Behavioral Sciences program. So we'll have that connection to Kansas. And I've been a special ed teacher as well before, long in the past. Um, <laughs> and uh, those, that's where my heart is, is with special ed. So um, I'm going to open it up now, um, see if we have any, any questions here yet. And I have a question just to kind of get us started and then um, see what other questions come in from all of our participants here. Um, and I was reading some of, the, some of the work that both of you have done, um, as well as I'm struggling to as um, a educator and working with students who are becoming special ed teachers, as well as I'm also a parent of a high school child um, with multiple learning disabilities. So I'm, I'm living in both worlds and I'm having to be her at home teacher and work with her. School started two weeks ago for us. Um, and so I, I, I have sort of both perspectives here. So just an opening, I was really thinking about the, um, the pre-packaged curriculums. Um, right now, a lot of districts are kind of scrambling and just saying, we need to get everybody online. And they're using a lot of these pre-packaged curriculums. Um, and then so how might, you know, recommendations and how you might address what teachers can do with these prepackaged curriculums for the students with disabilities. 
Yeah, that's a really, that's a super good question. <laughs> so, well, I think, I think, did you want to talk first, Ray? No, I'll let you go first. It's always beauty before age. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, and I'm really glad that, that uh, Linda went to KU because I, I have this theory that a lot of, a lot, not everybody who, but a lot of people who, um, are very interesting, go through Kansas eventually. So it's just one of those <laughs> places in the world that you just sort of, you've got to pass through it. Walt Disney did it, F. Scott Fitzgerald did it. Like, there's just lots of people like that. So, um, well, your problems or your issues with accessibility and especially with this curriculum is interesting to me. And what I, what I saw especially during the spring was people rush to give resources to teachers, right? And my metaphor about that was a supermarket sweep, right? Where they're just, you're just grabbing stuff off the shelf or in the 1970s, Laverne and Shirley, there was an episode <laughs> where they went and they, they ended up with all this stuff in their shopping cart and then there's like no way to sort it or make any decisions about it. And so one of the things I've actually been working on um, along with some collaborators is a framework for evaluating online instructional materials and um, along with sort of a checklist but I didn't want people to, to just give people the checklist and have them think that well if it has all these things then that means it's great curriculum but um, to sort of think about teachers in terms of giving them frameworks and principles and one of those is accessibility and um, and th there's four of them accessibility it's about active engagement and then also the curriculum needs to advocate for inclusion and then also accountability and um, we can I, I can share more about that later but for sure like there's a need to like give teachers frameworks to figure out how to sort this stuff and to ask critical questions so rather than like giving them a formula or a recipe too, because they have to think about what they want um, the child to get out of the curriculum. And then also they have to think about what, what's available and what the resources are. So, and Ray and I have talked about this, but one of the things that was really hard about the spring was that um, people assumed the a one-to-one -one relationship between the online setting and the in-person setting that that if you were on the computer in a school or in a home or you know that it didn't matter which and the environment in which you are learning aside from the fact that you're on the computer is also very important for thinking about larger issues of accessibility so i'll let ray talk now I so i tend to take the legal side of things and mary does the um more instructional side of things and the Office for Civil Rights has cited a number of school districts when they purchase digital resources and do not do any assessment of them related to accessibility. There is an item called the um, Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, VPAT. And I have fun going to conferences and talking with vendors and ask them for their VPAT. Um, as a school district, if you are making purchases of digital resources, you have a legal responsibility in terms of the way that things have been interpreted to, before you purchase it, to look at it to ensure that it is fully accessible. If you have not done that, then sort of, you know, things start to become problems. So when you've got, I like Mary's example in the supermarket tossing people things in before they go to the checkout they should be checking the vpat to see if the product is identified as being accessible so that's just sort of the simple from the legal side issue that needs to be considered the other is and looking at the research on what was happening in the spring the research said that teachers were making decisions about the tools that they were getting based on whether it was going to be easy for them. Not that it was necessarily going to be a workable product for their students. So that we've got that side of things that people are making decisions based on the wrong things. And then just, um, well, 
we'll pick up other things as we go along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's definitely like, there's, there's those kinds of tools that can help you make decisions. So I know um, sometimes though stuff has VPAT certification that may not really be all that accessible. So kind of like how magically the, the day after the common core state standards were passed, all of everything that you saw that was published was suddenly common core compliant <laughs> and compatible. You know, they just sort of slap the sticker on it or um, you know, sometimes there's new versions, right, that get developed and then there's not a new review with VPAT. So um, that's something that's interesting to be aware of. And, and also, like, like I was saying before, that to, to me, it's important also to empower teachers with questions, critical ones, such as very easily, like, can the students access this material across multiple formats? So like, is it a Word document, a PDF? Is there, can they look at it as a PowerPoint? Can they listen to it? Like just sort of that, does the design of the material support the students in using it? So usually that means, is, you know, is there a linear direction? Um, are the, are there buttons do they say exactly what you what happens when you click the button rather than just things like click here um things like that are can you make the chat text bigger or smaller so there's those kinds of design issues as well right now in neurological research there's lots of stuff about how eight seconds is a really important time period for like a hook for something and so a lot of stuff's being produced with that sort of eight second plant count, which might work really well for most people, but maybe folks with processing delays that would all of a sudden like not fit with them. Um, one thing I work on a lot is text like complexity and readability. So one of the things that brought me to Kansas was the fact that I was teaching, I was working with students who were English learners and who were either classifying into special education or coming out of it. And it, I was just like, just, unbelievable just flummoxed by the amount of text that was just completely above their text complexity and um there was not good ways to think about how to adjust it or or access those materials and so then i started communicating with don deschler at ku and i was like there's no there's no text the text is wrong and um that was sort of the way that we became introduced to each other, but there are reading, there are readability analysis tools that can kind of give teachers information. I just put one in the chat box. It's like just copy and paste some of this text and just see how hard it is. And also in some of my research, I found that if you go, you start on a landing page and then as you use hyperlinks, right, to go from page to page, the reading level changes and fluctuates like quite a bit and there's not warnings or about that at all and then the last part is the visual material and does the visual material like support the text if there's a person with visual impairment are there alt is there you know alt text for that um richard mayer's work is on in illustrations that instruct was really the like, key for me in thinking about that and so just thinking about those four questions um multiple formats, general design, readability, visual support is going to go a long way in helping teachers decide if something is accessible or not. So I'm going to raise an issue now. I told Michael I would do this to you guys. Um, where's the captioning? We're doing a live meeting. We should be live captioned. Mm -hmm. And not doing that mm -hmm. is making this not fully accessible. So when we're looking from the school perspective at having any sort of web instruction, there should be live captioning. And I will tell you, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I mean, Zoom at this point does not have live captioning built in. You can get it by paying an additional amount of money and having um, some captioning. I won't go into the technical stuff, but you can have it done. There are other tools that have captions built in. The fact that you are using a web service without captioning says it's not fully accessible, guys. You need to be setting a better example. 
And I, I got to tell you, I actually went to our IT director. I was part of his Zoom given information. And I said, we need to, you just provided a link of here's how you get accessibility. I mean, how, this is how you get the closed captioning. And I said, but do we even have it? And I, and I actually, I never heard back. I said, we need to know, is this something that we have here at Toro? And I never heard back from our IT director about the closed captioning because, yes, I was, I was the one pursuing that with our IT department. So um, we have some people on, on, uh, on our panel who may have more power than I do <laughs> to, to, uh, to make sure that happens, that Toro does. Um, I could file a complaint with OCR. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'll tell you the recording, when we post the recording, we will make sure we have closed caption on that recording. We do do that on the back end, but Ray, you know, this is uh, Dr. Santiago, I'm the director of the Graduate School of Education. And I think to your point, like it takes all of us pushing on this all the time because it is not, as Linda's pointing out, an easy lift, right? Um, and even though these things are all federally protected and there are laws that we should be observing, um, even when I was a school site principal, you know, it just takes labor to get people to move in the direction we need to move in. So I'm just yeah. curious what your thoughts are about that. So as we were talking about the use of digital resources, we missed a piece. And that's the accessibility piece at the front end. And there has been the assumption, and we've seen this across the country, where the school has assumed that every student has a computer, that every student has high speed internet, or maybe they don't have a computer, but they've got a smartphone. Well, not every app that they're looking at that they're pulling off the shelves there necessarily works with a smartphone. Um, what happens when you have, in my community, they have gone out and given each family a Chromebook. But what happens when you have two students or three students in the same family? They don't all have access, but they've assumed a starting point in the day for time. So there's a whole lot of accessibility issues before you even get to the point of having content delivered to students. And, you know, we have talked about um, just in terms of things, you know, it used to be the digital divide, then the homework divide. You know, now we're talking digital accessibility, but all those things still follow through. And when school districts make the assumption that every student has full access and understands just the issues. I mean, Mary was using one simple example in terms of buttons and having buttons labeled. I'll give you the other side of that. You have the red button and the green button. Oh, yeah. Colorblind. Colorblind. And, you know, I will... Linda, in terms of special ed programming, do you indicate to your students as they're going through the special ed program that colorblindness is a disability? Because I will tell you that special ed programs do not tend to consider colorblindness as a disability, and we know that at the higher ed level, they do, the disability services offices do not consider colorblindness as a disability. And yet, that is one of the most frequently cited issues in terms of digital access that OCR, DOJ, Department of Justice, OCR is Office for, I'm sorry, I'm doing acronyms and I shouldn't do that. Um, OCR is the Office for Civil Rights. It's the US Department of Education's enforcement agency that is looking at both ADA and Section 504 um, regulations. And Section 504 is this law, which has been around for a long time. Um, that says you need to be providing students with disabilities with their appropriate education. And so we've got the legal issues that are there, ADA 504, um, that play out. And people need to be aware of those. And then I'm just going to throw out another term just for fun. Um, universal design for learning. And Mary was hitting on it without calling it universal design for learning, but making the reference to the issues that you need to think about in terms of designing the curriculum side. And for the teachers, though, they are, say, taking a curriculum, 
uh, from their district. And they're the ones that are having to do the work to make sure they have the multiple means of engagement for the students. Also, how, you know, we talk about the representation, how, how the students are receiving the information. Again, the multiple modes of receiving the information, whether it's video, text, alt text, closed caption, all of those things. A lot of that goes on to the teachers to do that work, to yep. think yep. about the accessibility. Collecting the products properly. There are a number of products out there, curriculum products, that are designed around UDL that have multiple representations built in. But if you're not thinking about who you're making these things accessible for, who you're providing the support for, then you're not counting on those issues as you're selecting the products. Yes, because I think a universal design is a strong way to start, especially with terms of course design. Um, but it won't necessarily help you decide on an accommodation for an individual child. And so those things still have to be negotiated often between parents and teachers and so forth. And what I did in an ideal world, right, you would minimize as much as you could the amount of sort of going back and fixing up right at the end, right? Because the whole idea behind universal design is as much forethought and planning, even, even at stuff like access points. So um, during the pandemic, we, I got my daughter's math homework and it was a, it was a piece of paper. So I had to log in. So here's all the access points. I have to log in to the Google Classroom. And then I have to um, find that document. And then I've got to open it up. It's a PDF. And it was written with a Sharpie, like just freehand. And I have to download the document and have her write on it and scan it and re-upload it. And turn it put it in the place where the teacher can see it and luckily i have a phd and <laughs> my situation wasn't as dire as some folks and i you know had high speed internet at my house and i actually have a writable version where i can take a, a pdf document and make it so she could write on it and things like that but i was that was really you know like i just kept noticing all these different access points and, you know, even in, in a universal design framework, like some of that isn't going to be taken care of unless we bring it to teachers consciousness. Like how many, how many of these things are you asking parents and children to do? You put together a series of interesting questions on the uh, chat side, Mary, that I was just glancing through. I thought they were questions for us and realized they were yours. But let me just make a real simple thing. If you're Teacher, do not use PDFs. If you're in higher ed and you're a teacher, don't use PDFs online. PDFs have problems with them without going into it. Simple solution, don't use a PDF. You know, a lot of my, my students um, who have dyslexia, the PDFs are great for having them with the read out loud for them to be able to use the operating systems to be able to um, follow along and and read and hear simultaneously um, with the PDF. So Linda, you know that there are two different versions of PDFs, right? Mm -hmm. One version is a graphic, which does not read at all. Right. So the PDFs, you have to be very careful and explicit right. in the version of PDF they are using. And yes, there are some versions of PDFs that can, you can read depends on what screen reader you're using too is the how supportive that PDF is for the screen reader that's being in use. Make it accessible. Think about the users, not think about the faculty's convenience. And, and, and you know, a lot of this uh, nowadays you can find in Google, you can find in their operating system. It used to be Mac was great about the accessibility features and that wasn't in um, usable for uh, PC users. But now Google really has some accessibility tools so that they can use the voice to text, text to voice, all of that built into their operating system the way Apple has actually had for, I don't know, at least a decade. Yeah. And that was something I would always show uh, my students of, okay, we don't have to buy 
these expensive devices, let's look in the operating system and use the accessibility features in the operating system. And that's a huge tool to making, taking the material that you have that you're using as a teacher and making them a little more accessible to some of the students say. Um, but it is, it is a problem I know with the, with the image. And I, my, uh, for my daughter, I get papered handouts from her teacher in English. I would scan them and it scanned it as an image. And then I would have this other, then I would have to use a, Adobe Acrobat Pro to convert it into movable images so that then it becomes something that she could use with the, get the, uh, the text to voice. All of that I had to do, no one at the district did. And that was the only way to get the classroom materials made accessible to her. And I know she's not the only student with dyslexia, you know, at this high school of 2,500 kids. <laughs> so here we are with two people with PhDs who are having to use a range of technology to make their, the instruction for their students accessible. What about the parents who don't have a degree, who don't have the technology, that that is the big issue in terms of accessibility. We cannot let the schools just assume that everybody is going to have a PhD and going to have high speed internet and multiple apps. That just does not work in this situation. And if we have students who are in that situation, especially special needs students, then let's charge the schools, make sure that the parents are challenging the schools, are ensuring that the students' IEPs are met. We have a question like here. Mohammed has a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was, uh, was going to say, yeah. he wanted to know what's an alternative of PDF in online courses that would be uh, provide full access to everyone. There's not going to be one thing that's going to be provide, that's going to provide access to everyone, and that's part of the issue. You need to know what your student population is and what their needs are. Word can be a better tool for a lot of students, but you gotta be able to read Word. You know, so where are you, how are you delivering the content? Um, if you're gonna send somebody a Word document, then they've gotta have Word. Whoops, that doesn't work because who's got Word? So now we're into um, Google Docs and you have to have a connection and you have to have the app, oh, well, not the app, the um, accessibility and the tool. It, Google Docs is not going to be friendly if you have to do it on a phone. So you've got to have a variety of different approaches to it. One size does not fit all in this situation. So um, we have a, a quiet audience, so I was gonna see if you two have, um, want to be able to talk, because uh, we talked a little bit about curriculum and stuff, but also about the demonstration of confidence um, and um, really about assessment and showing for students to be able to show that they have the content um, and a variety of options for online uh, demonstration for special ed students who could be, you know, nonverbal or difficulty writing, have dysgraphia, um, dyscalculia, things like that. So to um, maybe you guys can speak a little bit to that uh, about some of the options with um, demonstration. I'm going to start, Mary, because I'm going to play a little bit against what Linda was saying. Um, we're not talking about online learning. We're talking about remote learning. Every time we talk about re online learning, we are confusing the issues. What we're looking at in this situation with the pivot is something that we talk, call remote learning. It's people figuring out what to do in an, immediate, in an emergency situation. When we're talking about virtual learning, when we're talking about online learning, we're talking about a setting where the faculty have had training, where they have had a significant amount of time to prepare a course. Those courses are generally asynchronous. And when we're looking at what's happening with remote learning, unfortunately, a lot of people are doing Zoom. And they think that just they're going to use Zoom to replicate what they do in the classroom. Don't do that. Wrong approach. Totally evil. Um, you look at 
how long can you stand being on Zoom? And by the way, you notice I've got a background, so I'm not showing you at the bulging where I am, where my house, what condition is behind me. But you have to have the right level of computer to be able to do that. Um, you know, Mary's got up in the sky, and Linda has things up in the sky. So they, they're protecting it. Kids don't always have that option. And they don't necessarily want to be showing what's going on in their home. And then the new one I just saw, and I think I sent, I don't know if I sent that to you, Mary, the school system that has put out a dress code for Zoom sessions. Mm -hmm. um, guys, let's think about this and be realistic. Okay. Go ahead, Mary. <laughs> All right. So thinking about assessment, I think there's three important principles. And those principles are useful, meaningful, and equitable. So, and useful is useful for purposes, right? So is it, is the assessment gonna tell us something that we need to know? So meaningful is, is, um, is usually those issues about reliability and validity, right? And then the, there's equitable, right? It's gotta be equitable for all. And the problem with those principles, even as much as I embrace them, is that often they run counter to each other, right? Because often the assessments that are the most useful or the most equitable, like do not fit well into traditional notions of reliability and validity. And we all know this because, especially with thinking about students with disabilities and, and matching and all, like all of those kinds of things that you have to do. But if you can think about assessment, you know, from a principled stance and, um, and also like, I really like sociocultural notions of empowerment where what the student produces is their assessment of the content, right? And so then you wouldn't always have to be like have putting them in the downward position of being assessed. And I think as we start to like think about those, especially since hey, this is a new world, right? We're on the internet and we've been told for years by the Christensen Institute that this is, this is gonna upset, disrupt, I guess, learning and you know, new times and new innovations and new this and new that, then we can't come onto the internet, even though there's a pandemic and replicate all the things about the educational process that were the most broken, right? And that's one thing that I talk about a lot with teachers and in other spaces is that we shouldn't bring our worst pedagogies and, and Ray alluded to this. <laughs> so meaning long lectures and things like that online, even if they feel like the most portable. So we should, we should do what we need to do to bring our best pedagogies for arranging students to collaborate. Like I said, for putting them in the position of the assessor rather than always being the assessed um, and then also, like I said, just principles around, you know, useful, meaningful, equitable. And that's, you're really talking about a really a student-centered classroom, which is really contrary to how a lot of us in the past have approached teaching. It's a little bit power hoarding. We're the experts. We know, we talk. And the students are producing, the students are working together that is gonna be more equitable and accessible to students with disabilities for whatever their participation and their demonstration can be. And I, and I really love that approach. Yes, well, and with students with disabilities, sometimes they get restricted. Um, I think a structure is good, right? But, but sometimes they get too restricted um, along the lines of, deciding a priori like with the within the IEP or whatever like how they have to be assessed and it's not always ways that are ultimately empowering to them even though I think that's usually the intention of the IEP team but and that's why I think those principles around usefulness meaningfulness and equity equity are really kind of critical and also thinking about them as agents of control in this assessment process. And so it's not just about you tell the student, well, you can demonstrate your learning any way you want because while some students may take that up right away, so other students need help thinking about, well, how is it that I want to do this? What kinds of examples are there? And that to me, that's the constant tension that you see, particularly, it's always been there, but particularly in online curriculum in that the structure makes us feel safe 
but it's act it's so much better for affect if we have choices and so always thinking about how to toggle back and forth when you're trying to design important online curriculum so we got a question or comment from makeda and i um mary and i have had discussions about this issue and i think actually linda got involved as well there was we started this whole thing back in the spring and we knew at that point that people had to pivot there was no professional development happening for our faculty at the time so we get into summer and there's a good time to be doing some professional development looking at what might happen in the pivot and we've got a whole bunch of schools that said we're not going to do anything different. We're go it's going to be schooling as normal in the 2021 school year. They did not prepare the teachers. They did not prepare the administrators. They did not think about any of the issues uh, that involve now as we're approaching, or in some cases have already started, and they're trying to figure out what to do. The school systems have made it harder for the faculty by not help preparing them, by not determining what tools they were going to use. Were they going to, in fact, get a district license for Zoom and then show people how to use Zoom? I mean, we're playing with Zoom here, but there are a lot of features that um, are operating behind the scene and that make a difference in terms of students. We just talked about captioning as an issue. So there are things that need to be considered or should have been considered. And I would argue that, okay, so we've started the school. You don't have to be committed to exactly what you said you were going to be doing in a plan. Look at providing some time for professional development, get professional development to the faculty to help them understand, <clears throat> excuse me, what the options are and to be able to use the tools that you are providing for them more effectively and efficiently. <clears throat> we know that in some cases the teachers do have not had good tech at home. They have not had good internet connectivity at home. Schools have to provide that to them if they're expecting them to do those things about a camera, about a headset, if they're going to be doing those things. But understanding the difference between, as Mary was saying, what we do in the classroom and what we do in a remote teaching situation. Yes. So, because if you definitely, if you've got to think about time, you know, like then there's some guidelines that have been recommended from homeschooling that I put up. And then also virtual charter schools in some states have like attendance policies. And those might be things to look at, but I think those are too high. I actually think they estimated too high because they were trying to align with a traditional school, but it's definitely like a place to start. And also um, just to consider things about real video. And I wonder sometimes if this is really about uh, student learning, like how we're making these decisions about how much time to be online, or if this is about surveillance for teachers, right? And making sure teachers are like earning their money. <laughs> and if that's what we're doing, right? If that's why we're insisting that kids be online for a certain amount of time, then I hope people will rethink that. And just following up, in the spring, we had states that put out guidance as to how much time they expected students to be in an education setting. And the thing that I remember is no more than three hours for high school students. Mm -hmm. So Linda, I assume your high school student is attending school for more than three hours. But basically some of the guidance that we saw would say, that's not necessary. It should only be three hours. So um, the rest of the time is, uh, study hall or um, whatever, the whole notion of measuring learning based on seat time is a fallacy. It has been something that we've been fighting. I've did congressional testimony over 20 years ago on that one. Um, we don't need to be measuring learning by seat time. We need to be figuring out what works for the students and recognize that students are going to learn at different rates 
and focus on the learning, not seat time, and figuring out how to assess where the students are yeah. and providing services to have them reach those. So, well, go ahead. and even traditional notions about time in school has always been those circles, right? So you have allocated time, and then inside that you have instructional time, and then you have engaged time, which is usually like <laughs> a very small circle. And what we're doing when we're moving online is we are taking the alloc since the allocated time now is theoretically all the time, then we have to think about what the instructional time can look like and realize it doesn't have to be all synchronous. And, it, and then you have to think about then the engaged time and what portion of the engaged time then needs to be with a teacher, um, with peers, or independent. And especially when you were talking about students with uh, disabilities, um, mm -hmm. being in a whole group listening to a teacher is not going to be an effective method for them of, of engagement. Um, you know, and, and you know, think about all these kids who have focus issues. And now you're at home, there's, you're surrounded by noise, things are in your environment, you're, and the focus is gone. So if you want to get engagement, it's not gonna be about a whole class instruction with one individual. And that's where like working with the peers, like you were saying, things like that engagement with in pairs and pairing shares and things like that, that you're able to do, or working on a, towards a project and a goal, with other people is going to be more effective for students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Depending on the tech. Yeah. You know, it, I mean, it's, it's easy to say all these things, but if you've got students who are having problems with the tech, the fo having the focus issue, um, you can't assume that the parent is going to be there to help them with the focus. Okay. And we know that there were some schools that wrote, tried to write in to their IEPs, the parents as the service provider, which is wrong. And we've also got school districts that tried to have the parents give up their rights and responsibilities related to the IEP so that the school district could do anything with the student, basically ignoring the IEP. So the initial issue, and just as we we're getting started, what do you tell parents? You tell parents to make sure that if they have a special needs student, that they're getting in the creation of the IEP, that the IEP is something that they will are happy to live with, because that's how things are set up for their student. And we've got some schools that are doing a wonderful job providing service remotely with students with IEPs, and then. This is the story that I'd like to tell. It's not a good story, but it was a district in Massachusetts that when the secretary put out her guidance to say that you need to provide students with special ed the same kinds of services that you are providing your students in regular ed. So the superintendent said, oh, we can solve that very nicely. We're closed. They basically tried to stop school in March so that they would not have to provide services to students with IEPs. Um, luckily, they, were, they bragged enough about that, so it made it into the paper, and the State Department of Education found out and put out some guidance on it. But we've got great schools, and we've got great schools that provide education to general ed school students, and we've got schools that are not thinking about special needs students you need to figure out where your school stands in that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And then if they are not providing the services, you will need to become an advocate for your student more so than you have been right along. Yeah. Well, another thing we saw was, had, was parents signing waivers and not realizing necessarily all the implications. So saying, oh, we don't need special education services. And then a third problem that emerged was when governors signed their declarations about who was an essential worker, they didn't include people who served students with disabilities in lots of states. And that 
really was a problem because those those people were really critical to providing access. And Ray and I have worked, we've known each other for a long time and we've we've um, sounded in various people's ears about the problem of like the instructional assistant and what role they, that kind of person might play in a not fully online setting, which has had not, has has not been fleshed out yet, but would have been really useful to have done so in this time. Um, also like using, thinking about home health models and like how, and helping parents who cannot provide or simply do not deign to provide certain aspects of the educational um, environment, educational experience to the student. So, and then going back to what Linda said too about um, students with disabilities who may be highly distractible and in a traditional classroom the teacher like the first thing you learn in classroom management is you got to get their toys from them <laughs> that's lesson one is you got to get their toys and um, so then traditional classrooms as a response to technolo technological innovation have largely focused on getting that stuff away from kids, their cell phones. We only use our iPads under these circumstances with huge amounts of control. And then all of a sudden this remote learning happened and then those students don't have any framework for regulating their use. And the internet, remember, is expansive. And if you want to, you want to listen to your teacher talk about the Peloponnesian War ad nauseum or are you going to look up your favorite site? And so then coming back to and thinking about um, talking with students about setting goals and noticing their attention patterns and things like that is also going to be critical going into the school year. So, because remember, we've got till October, right, in teacher education. So you've got till October <laughs> to help students get into a good space. That's usually the goals that you're setting. And, um, and it's okay if it takes you longer than that, but usually you tell new teachers, especially, to sort of think about rhythming and norming heading into October and um, to have those conversations with them about well what do you think will be different about learning online and what do you think your attention span is have them map it <laughs> that's a good special education you know data collection kind kind of thing and um, just to really um, collaborate I guess with young people. Daniela AP say uh, Danielle has raised the question in the chat. She's asking a concern about a student four-year-old special preschool. He was in school for three hours and then six hours of ABA daily. And her concern is that how will he get one hour of instruction compared to the eight to nine hours daily? Um, what can the parents do as the parents help maintain his progress and any tools to help maintain that student's progress? Starting point is you go back to the school district with the IEP and you point out to them the IEP and their responsibility. That IEP technically is a legal document. It's a contract between the parents and the school system about providing service for the student. And so depending on your school system and their, how friendly their, the special ed services are, you may have to fight, you may not have to fight. If you have to fight, then look at the appeals process. And as I've said, you have got to become an advocate for your child. And that may mean providing some fight. Uh, I don't know, I assume you're in California and there are um, support organizations in California to support parents. Um, and I assume that Linda would be able to provide some of that information if you call her at some other point in time. Yes, and I was going to say, Danielle, if you want to just send me an email, um, I'll, uh, I'll put in my um, email address here. Um, I will send you a whole bunch of, um, of stuff for that age group. Um, and honestly, since COVID, a network of special educators, we've all been sharing everything. And I have friends in New Jersey sending me things and all over the country, we're all sharing um, resources and materials for especially, you know, preschool age kids, um, social things, social emotional materials, behavior management materials for little kids and uh, strategies. So everyone's been like jump, jumping on and helping and it's been great. So anyway, I, I will uh, be happy to send you that stuff. 
Yes. Well, and, and Ray and I, and also our, our associates have been for a long time really advocating hard for special education services to not be unnecessarily cropped, <laughs> right, or taken off when a student moves into virtual learning. And we see this happening a lot where you had 250 minutes of services that all of a sudden goes down to 25. But remember, we also said that we didn't necessarily like kids sitting having six hours worth of screen time. And so thinking about how to, what services have to look like and what those rhythms need to be. And maybe those minutes would come down some to some extent, but to just sort of decide, well, now you're only gonna get this without like really thinking about what that should look like for the student. And then the other problem we see is that teletherapy is a wonderful thing and the research says that children who have teletherapy do about as well with it generally as who do it in person. Some students even do better, but they're always really clear on teletherapy needs to be a team decision that's based on an evaluation of whether or not it is appropriate for the child. And the reason why those studies often find such good results in teletherapy is because they did that. So they went through and identified children specifically who they thought, given what we know, would benefit. And, um, and so just the decision of like, well, we can't do it in person now, so we'll just do it online is not the right decision making process. And I think it's, it's important to raise those concerns. And One of the things said, Mary, was that it's a team decision. And I just want to point out that the parent is part of that team. It's not the team over here and the parent make separate from that. The parent is part of that team. And so they need to be advocating for the student. Again, I'm sorry, I keep saying that, but that's the important part. That's the important role. Yeah. Go ahead, Linda. Oh, I was just gonna say that um, a number of my students who are doing their masters in, in ABA, um, they are providing services to kids in the home uh, young kids in all ages um, using telehealth um, to provide those services. However, that is provided typically through the insurance company and not through the school districts. And so we ha there's this difficulty. They have to work this fine line of teaching the skills that are necessary, but not doing educational uh, curriculum. Um, uh, they're doing the, the telehealth and so it's and it, it's a it's a fine line because of course often they're so i mean obviously they're tied together um so um but yeah a lot of them are um a lot of them are still going and doing their services still getting their aba services but they're doing it via telehealth and it and all the research and all the data so far is showing that it's been effective so yes well and one of the things that was bothering us as well is that um, children in the home when there's multiple children would be served simultaneously yeah. and no teletherapist with a license who wants, wants to keep it would think has said that that's a good idea and so <laughs> and so I think like there needs to be you know more information to parents about what those services should look like too but certainly when they're done well Right when when by and telehealth, I got I got to hand it to them. They made a really nice pivot, you know, about six eight years ago to having um, online de service delivery be a, a supported part of the practice as they learn to be therapists. So if you go and learn how to be a speech therapist, then it's part of your coursework to learn how to deliver it this way. It's not an extra thing you've got to pick up, like teaching online. Unfortunately, has been. But you, we also have to be, like I said, really careful about what would be appropriate for the student and, um, and having to take all the other kids out and do something with them while one kid receives telehealth is, is hard. Teletherapy is hard in some home situations. And are we, how are we gonna make sure that families have the bandwidth for certain things like speech therapy? You, you, like you really need to see the lips move and to you know make sure that people have the resources and support and that they've got they've got questions to ask right and i know we're going to have to be wrapping up um pretty soon so i just wanted to see if um even one of you want to 
give a, a, any kind of suggestion you have for the participants as far as um, um, tools or suggestions for teachers for providing high quality instruction to students with disabilities, like one, one kind of suggestion for them. As a starting point, I just posted OCR's operational definition of accessibility. And that sort of puts a frame on some of the issues that we've been talking about. And OCR uses this all the time when they are citing people for being bad. <laughs> and it's very simple. Those with a disability are able to acquire the same information and engage in the same interactions and within the same time frame as those without disabilities. So as you're thinking about the resources for students, as you're thinking about what should be happening with students with special ed, keep that definition in mind. Yes, so and I think one, one of the, this is the Tech Act early on, or maybe it was a later Dear Colleague letter, but talked about substantial equivalent use. Is a real is an important phrase. So, but I would just my advice to teachers, for sure, is to um, start thinking about those those questions about accessibility and that I put above earlier, and to also think about new ways to collaborate with parents and children around what their needs are because. Um, parents have to, they've got to take on their roles as partners in fairer ways, potentially, than what they had been doing. Um, but this can be also a really rewarding experience, and I hope that this really shifts education in positive ways. And the last thing I got to say is that um, there, earlier, I don't know if she's still on, but one of the people who made a comment was Linda Fuller in the chat box, and that was my high school English teacher. And so I just thought it was really important for me to shout to her and tell her, <laughs> I we, see you and I love you. And <clears throat> There's a point of information. If you are interested in collecting all of the links and things that Mary sent, posted, you can save the chat. There are three little buttons, three little um, dots on the right side where you would post something. If you click on that, it says save chat. You can save the chat. And that gives you access to all the content pieces that and the information that's in the um, chat. And again, this points out tools to learn how to use Zoom or whatever it is that you're using. All right, look, I, I really appreciate this conversation. Uh, I learned a lot from all of you. Um, I think the, the part of the conversation that really piqued my interest most is just uh, the lack of preparation that some of our schools and school districts have put into distance learning uh, for the fall, but also the, the strategies and, and advice that you all gave to support our families and, and our children. So learning learning remote learning <laughs> well, yes yes um so next week we will we will be continuing our diversity now series uh we will have scholar activism uh we'll have three uh powerful uh community educators from the sacramento area that will be talking about the importance of scholar activism for our students especially given uh the times that we're in um and then uh, we'll, we'll, we're continuing trugging along into uh, the end of August and into September as our Diversity Now series continues to get better and better every week. Uh, just want to throw a quick shout out to the EDI program. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about equity, diversity, and inclusion in education, please check out our EDI program. Uh, we are about creating leaders and activists and scholars all in one. Uh, yes, you can be all three and still uh, make an impact in education. Outside of that, I wanna thank uh, Mr. Rose, uh, Ms. Rice, uh, Ms. Haynes, and uh, Michael and Louise for this opportunity again. And we will see you all next week. Hi, thank you.